You're watching EVH and Gear TV, brought to you by Stuart Travel Guitars. See the incredible stowaway travel guitar at StuartGuitars.com. Microphones for EVH and Gear TV are provided by Rode Microphones. And official Van Halen merchandise is provided by VanHalenStore.com. Here's your host from Ontario, Canada, EVH artist Eric Broadbent. Hey everyone, happy Saturday to you. It is weekend. Nice to have you back. We're here on a special new time slot, 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific. We're moving our shows from Fridays here to Saturday. And uh, today we've got guitarist Ethan Brosh joining us. Ethan, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Eric. It's great to have you, man. It's it's been it's a uh, you know a real pleasure to talk guitar with you and some gear and all kinds of fun stuff. And uh, it's kind of a, becoming a family affair because we've got your sister coming up next week as well, too. Oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah, okay. she's coming. Yeah, she's coming on next week as well too. So, uh, we were supposed to have her on about a week ago, and I, I don't know if it was a wedding that she was attending or something. There was something that uh, uh, yeah. another commitment that she had, so we bumped her to uh, next I week. I got so. to do it before her, so that's, that's right. pretty cool. There, Gotta she, make sure to mention it to her. She's got some big shoes to uh, fill now. Yeah. <laughs> It's a real pleasure to have you here. We're going to jump over to the chat here in a second and say hi to a bunch of uh, uh, friends and fans that will be tuning in as well, too. Probably some people that are uh, from your camp as well, too. It would be nice to say hi to them. But awesome. you, you were saying to me um, you were going to be tired today. Did you have a gig last night, or were you in the studio or something? Or uh, It was a, a friend's birthday, and oh. it was just a uh, really late night, and then... Um... Today I'm going to see White Snake in a few hours. So. Oh, fantastic! Now, where where yeah. where are you at, and where are the, where are you seeing them at? Um, well, I I live in Boston. Okay. Right now, White Snake are playing tonight in um, in Rhode Island, and their new record came out yesterday, and I bought it, and that, it's actually a pretty good record after one listen. You know, it's uh, it's good to still have a. Uh, a band like White Snake releasing great material. I know, I know it, and touring like crazy all the time. So that's 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 a good thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Chops are all still there. A, a great band. So they they've got uh, uh, obviously what Red Beach on guitar and, and Joe Hoekstra. Joe Hoekstra is exactly yeah. That's great. No, pretty sure Tommy Aldrich is uh, playing drums still. Who's playing so, bass with them? I'm I'm surprised. I don't know. Why don't uh, I know? Mike Devin is actually another local guy here uh, from Massachusetts. Okay. Yeah, that's gonna be a good show. No, do you know who the support act is for that? Not that it usually matters, but I mean, there's sometimes there's some great good bills. Uh, you know, good bands on the bill for support. I actually don't know. Yeah, I have no. Idea. I guess I'll find out pretty soon. For sure, for sure. Awesome. Let's go over the chat for a quick sec. Say hi to a few people that are jumping in already. We got Jack Clark here, uh, Nocturnal Butterfly, who is my better half here. She'll be sharing a lot of your links throughout the program. Uh, okay. To, you know, to all the all your properties, website, and uh, you know, social media, and that. Uh, Jack Clark, Guitar Hack, is here. Had a nice conversation with him just a little while ago. Uh, let me see. Ladybug is here. Charles Green. Thank you so much. Todd Graff is jumping in as well, too. Uh, Tony Fuentes. Uh, good morning, Eric and Ethan. I uh, love it. Ethan Shreds. We need more videos upload, uh, uploaded from Ethan soon. Um, yeah. that, that's a good call. Uh, do, you, do you do a lot of video and stuff? Like, I mean, I know you have a YouTube channel, stuff like that, but is that something that's very important to you and you'd like to maybe do more of that? Yeah, um, I actually, it's kind of a weird time that we we live in right mm -hmm. now um, because I've always done pretty big production music videos and it seems like, you know, you spend so much time and effort and money and you, you, go, you go all out to create a really great looking mus music video and it seems like um nowadays youtube or social media and uh, all these platforms would actually favor videos that are 30 seconds where i can just be sitting here and i can just shred something that's totally out of context that means nothing and i'll put that out there and those platforms will just favor those kinds of videos over you know something that you know you really try very hard to create something that really means something right um so but i still like to release real music videos for for some of my tunes and that's something that i'm going to keep doing and occasionally i'll just you know do like these 
quick videos or quick lessons and just throw them on, on Facebook or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like that's what you have to do nowadays. I, I know I, I kind of feel your pain there. Obviously, I don't I wouldn't spend the, the budget that you do on some of your videos. I've seen a couple of them where you're like in the desert or wherever, like pretty amazing stuff. And it's got to be on Mars, of, actually. On uh, Mars. There you go. Yeah, you're Mars. on Mars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was a big budget to get uh, Elon Musk to take you up there in uh, one of the rockets. Yeah, yeah exactly. No, but but I, I do know what you mean, though. Like, And I've done some videos where I'll put lots of production, like when I'm doing a, a demo review on something or something of that nature, and I'll spend days on it, and it might only get a couple hundred views. And then I'll do something this like with an iPhone, bad lighting, you know, horrible stuff, and it could get thousands of views. And it's just like, okay, well, am I wasting my time doing this other stuff? But it's a passion, so you still want to give that level of commitment. It's, it's, yeah. I think we're all scratching our heads, right, when it comes to this stuff. You're throwing spaghetti at the wall, and you never know what's going to stick. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, and just like just yeah. before I, I called you, I was talking to Guitar Hack, who's in the chat here, and we were just talking YouTube you know, and things like that. And you know, he, he runs a really, really cool guitar channel too, really, really cool. And he has great participation in his chat. And, you know, we look at analytics and we, we measure these things. We all do. And, you know, when you're when you're a content creator or whether, whatever that case may be, you want to make sure that you're getting results, right? Are you reaching people, things like that? And 90% of my shows are 90 minutes long. Um, some of my shows, my shorter shows, are an, an hour long. And you look at the statistics, the average view people, they're watching for 15 minutes. But yet you see people, yeah. you, you, like, you just wonder, like, okay, what? how am I reaching these people? What's my my hot button what's not you know what i mean so you, yeah it's hard to measure these things yeah it's uh and it keeps changing every single day so it does it's really hard to uh figure out what to do plus you know i mean i'm just a guitar player mm -hmm. but it seems like to do all those things on on social media and making videos and stuff you you start becoming a slave to just like producing videos and editing videos and doing all of those things. And at the end of the day, I just want to play guitar. You know, I, I just, hear you. I know. I it's, don't want to like watch a, a thousand tutorials about what works and what doesn't work and what works today on YouTube and what works the next day on Facebook and on Twitter. And it's just so many platforms and they, they keep changing the rules every day. And then, um, you just uh, you end up spending so much time on those things, and that's before you even start thinking about rehearsing and writing music and and then going on the road and putting shows together. There, there's just so many things to deal with nowadays. I agree, and I yeah. I find as well too is like you know when we get the the bug the itch. Okay, I want to pick up the guitar. I got a riff in my head. I want to play, or just something inspires you, whatever it is. And then you get a variable that takes it away from you. Maybe you get a phone call from the boss. You got to come into work today, or you know maybe there's some kind of a problem, and it it's a buzzkill for you. And with okay. so social media, sometimes it can be like that, or just making this content. You know, it's like when, it, when I was saying this to my buddy earlier on the phone call too. It's like when, when stuff becomes work. You know, the fun gets taken out of it, you know, so I, I really yeah. do appreciate what you're saying when you when you're talking about you just want to play guitar. And yeah. I, and I think that's why these Instagram type of videos and all these, you know, quick little clips, as much as, you know, you're not getting uh, to the, know the person very, very well, but at least you're getting what you want and you can watch it and you can consume it quickly on the go. And then, you know, there's going to be more like that down the road. So you're not slaving to yeah. it if you're careful. That's right. Yeah. 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 There's a. Uh... There's a balance you can reach with those things for sure. I just haven't got there yet. <laughs> I know. Well, neither. I don't think we ever will get there because as soon as we think we get there, there's something new. There's new technology, and we have to jump on board to you know keep up with everyone else doing it. And then you're, yeah. you're on this treadmill that you're you're gaining two steps and you lose five. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Charles Green says, uh, "Hi, Eric. Tell Ethan that Tomb of the Gods is an awesome video." Oh. Awesome. Great. See, so at least somebody appreciates it. So <laughs> I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's a lot. Much for that. It, it, that's, see, that's the thing for sure is, you know, I do things in a different way than you. Like I'm not producing, you know, music videos and, and you know, writing albums, um, but I'm producing content. And when you, you, you kind of, I'm sure there's things that you put out there when you're, when you finally get them out, whether it be a record or something like that, you're just like, okay, I'm so glad to just be done this. 
because there's a lot of labor that goes into it. But then you get the feedback, like you know, I, just like like Charles just said, I love your video. So that's like, okay, wow, a I, I person gets it, right? And it's very yeah. rewarding. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Appreciate thank you, Charles. Appreciate thank, it. Yeah, thank you, Charles. Appreciate that. Uh, Will Varela is here. Ladybug is here. Joe Hervey is here. Um, let me see here. Um, let me see if I got any other questions. Yeah, so I got Charles. Let me see if I go down to it. Brad Miller is here as well, too. Thank you for tuning in on this uh, beautiful, beautiful Saturday. Let me see here. Um, just, oh, JJ's, uh, JJK's House of Harleys. What's up, Eric? Nice live stream. Thank you so very, very much. Um, just last week, we had one of your mutual, our mutual buddies, uh, Michael Sweet, on the show, which was a really, really fun show. And uh, like, awesome. I don't know your whole career. I, I only know you uh, some of the solo things that you've done and things like that as well, too, and a lot of the clinics and demos that you do for gear companies. But um, I, you know, it was brought to my attention that you actually played on uh, Michael Sweet's solo record. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The, um, this record was called One Sided War. Right. Which okay. Is, uh, yeah, Michael Sweet's last record, and I actually just finished another solo for his brand new upcoming record um, that should be out pretty soon. Um, I think um, on the new one he has. He has a lot of guests, a lot of great guitar players that are on, like every guitar player is on one song. On the last record, One Sided War, it was uh, basically just uh, me and uh, Joel Hoekstra from Whitesnake. And I played on six songs and I'm on a couple of music videos uh, that Michael did. And um, yeah, that was a, a great record. It, it was it's been playing in my car. It was playing in my car for a long time. Yeah. Uh, all the songs were really catchy, really great. Um, Michael Sweet is, an, is uh, a perfect example of somebody who really stuck with um, with that style. He never really abandoned it. He, you know, still has the same attitude. He's unapologetic about liking that style and still writes in that style. He he sings just as well as, his, as he always did back in the 80s. And he's a great guitar player. Uh, I think his guitar playing is kind of underrated. I, I think I agree he's a with really you. great player. I agree with you on that. Yeah. And, um, you know, and he's really passionate about that stuff. He, he legitimately loves it and still checks out new equipment and is his head is really into it you know where a lot of these guys have just kind of like um you know they've grown up right and um unfortunately their head is not not in the game anymore yeah he's uh, he's a fan of, he's a fan of the business he's a fan of the musical genre I mean, that's why he yeah. came on the show. He wanted to talk about Van Halen. He's as much of a Van Halen fan as I am, and a lot of us, you know, that watch this show are. He wants to produce them. You know, he wants to get that word out to, you know, Eddie and the boys. Like, look, I, I want to produce your record. Let's get you guys rocking. You still got it in you. And, you know, I think that's why maybe he's kept his voice so long as well, too, that, you know, he's not just going through the motions like some people some people do, you know, yeah. kind of coasting, a, yeah. you know, an old 80s band. You know, they haven't toured in, th in you know, 30 years, and all of a sudden, let's go out and for a cash grab. You know, Michael's always been passionate about his craft, so that's very cool. How did yeah. you guys meet? I'm curious to hear the backstory on that. Oh, okay. Uh, actually, it was through Oz, uh, the guitar player, mm -hmm. the lead guitar player of Striper. Um, I met Oz many years ago. And we um, we started keeping in touch, you know, just as uh, as guitar players, you know, loving the same kind of things. And um, Oz started, um, you know, like he always put me on the on the guest list for Striper. Mm -hmm. You know, Oz, Oz is a really great guy. And through him, I I met Michael, and every time Striper came to town you know I always went to those shows and Michael actually told me years ago that he was thinking about putting together a solo band and he wanted me to play guitar for it okay and that was something that he had the idea of doing that but it never really came to fruition and he was always busy with something else because he does a lot of things mm -hmm. and um, I think three more years went by and then he just texted me and he was like I have this record coming up 
would you play on it? And I'm like, yeah, you sure. don't have to me twice to do that. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, and we, we clicked very well because, again, he, he's so into all that stuff. And um, we have so many, we share so many um, bands that we like, that we like the same bands and the same music. And um, so we had a really good time working on those things. And I'm, I'm very grateful to Michael because um, he exposed me to a whole crowd of um, other people and um, um, he did a lot for me and I'm very grateful for that. Oh, that's awesome. He does seem like a great guy. We've had several conversations. He's been on the show twice and we know we text occasionally, not a lot, you know, like, you know, birthdays and things like that, just that kind of thing. But he just seem, he does seem like a very giving uh, fellow and you know I'm not sure if you know that has you know with the Christian background and all kinds of things like that but he's just a giving guy and uh, yep. I, I can see that I can see what he want to take kind of take someone under his wings and you know if he, he's got the ability to help why not right that's awesome yeah no I can uh, I can attest to that he's definitely that kind of a person and you know and as great of a guitar player that he is you know he kind of like very easily was just giving me the stage. It's like, here, go, you know. Nice. Yeah, letting you have your thing, spotlight. You know, and just like, and that was, uh, I thought was really amazing of him to That's do that. That's cool. He, he is yeah. often uh, underrated when it comes to his guitar playing because everyone thinks, you know, they think of Striper as Oz. But look at when Oz was um, sick and down there for a bit. You know, um, they 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 played without him. They had to, you know, and, and they continued yeah. on the tour. And, you know, he holds his own. I mean, no no problem. Yeah, absolutely. And Michael was a guitar player first. You know, he wasn't even like I know. He didn't even mean to be a lead singer. So yeah, yeah, I can kind of do both things for sure. It, it's so yeah. funny, like the just the, the talent that he has, and that's why I was kind of joking about it. Well, I was joking, but I wasn't joking. We kind of took the conversation pretty serious about Van Halen, and you know, he really wants to produce them. And I said one of the things I did like about the the Sammy Hagar era is it was neat to see some dual guitar action a little bit. Now, Sammy, I would consider him a slouch compared to, to Michael. You know, Sammy can play guitar okay. He can sing really good. His guitar playing is, you know, average, I'll say, to, to be honest with you. Uh, but Michael, can you imagine some of the licks he could do with Eddie Van Halen? Yeah. It'd be, it'd be pretty cool. It'd be kind of neat. That would be nice. Yeah. I, I'd be... I would love to see that. <laughs> and we'll talk to Eddie Van Halen later in the program as well, too. Uh, a couple other questions here as well, too, coming in. Um Joe Hervey wants to know, I says, Eric, does Ethan prefer um, floating or uh, fixed bridges? We're going to talk a lot of 80s guitars and stuff in a little bit as well, too. But I, I, I picture you as a floating bridge guy. Are you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've always been uh, a Floyd Rose kind of guy, mm -hmm. a floating bridge. Uh, not necessarily a Floyd Rose. I like Kaler still, yep. obviously. And, um, um, yeah. I don't know. That That's just how I started. And... You know, there, there's a lot of people that make the argument where, you know, it does you don't get the same tone from a floating bridge, you know, and the fixed bridge sounds better and it resonates better mm -hmm. and all the tone purists will tell you that. But then again, you know what? Eddie Van Halen always played with a floating bridge and Adrian Smith from Iron Maiden and I think those guys have a pretty good tone. So, you know what? All those tongue purists can, you know, can argue that forever. I don't really care. It's just, um, I got to tell you, it, it's more difficult to actually play with a floating bridge. I get that. It's a real art form to actually play in tune. I'm not saying it, it stays in tune better than, uh, um, than a fixed bridge. But to play in tune, this is something where every time you bend a string, it's a completely different feel to actually stay in tune. And there's a lot of things that when you t when you play like a uh, a two string bend, mm -hmm. your floating bridge will just go like that. Yes. and you have to be really careful and really listen to the, to the tone that you're that's coming out of your speaker cab. You have to really uh, always be on top of it and make sure that you're perfectly in tune. It's a lot. It's a real art form to play in tune when you're playing with a floating bridge. But I mean, 
that is the sound of that style. You know, it is played with a floating bridge. And if it's good enough for Eddie, it's good enough for me. Mm. So... <laughs> Well, the thing, the thing, the thing is here. I find too, if, if you're a, a, a fixed bridge guy, or I shouldn't say a fixed grip, but a flush mount, a flush mount bridge, and the, and you go to a floating system, there's a real learning curve, because where a lot yeah. of guys or girls will go is like they've got that heavy hand on the bridge. Like I like to rest my hand on the bridge a lot, and you're going to be pressing mm-hmm. sharp. So that's one technique that you have to adapt for and compensate for. Right. Um, and then oh, yeah. so there's that. I do like what you say, too, as well as with bending the strings. You've got to be ready for that as well, too. It's almost like do you, have you ever driven a stick shift in a car? Do you, do you have a stick shift car? Oh, yeah. OK. That's how I got my license. There you, you know, go. Stick, so yeah. with a stick shift, you've got a clutch. Right. And you're pushing in the yeah. clutch. And I, I, I'd like to try to give analogies to, to compare things so, so people can kind of paint a, me- a mental picture. You know, if you, I'm not sure if you've ever burnt out a clutch. I burnt out clutches back in my day as a kid, you know, because I had a lot of stick shift cars. And, you know, you're popping the yeah. clutch and you're racing the clutch, whatever, and eventually you can burn it out. And so, you know, if I had a burnt out clutch and, and someone like, like you got in the car and let's say you didn't drive a stick and you drive my car for the first time, you're like, how do I drive this thing, right? You're not going to be mm-hmm. able to work that clutch. But I can do it because I know exactly where the sweet spot is. That's what it's like when you switch, you know, bridges yes. you know, from floating to fixed or flush. I should. I don't want to say fixed. I keep saying fixed yeah. bridge. That's not the term I'm looking for. I meant uh, flush. So it's a real uh, learning curve. But I think it, 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 exactly. And and you know what? It, it's like a float. A floating bridge is actually as you're describing. It's just it's 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 a lot more complex. And it's more difficult to deal with. It's more difficult to change strings. It's more difficult to play with it, to get, keep it in control, to always maintain it. Yet everyone is looking at a floating bridge as something immature. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and it shouldn't be like that. It really is a more complex system. So... Yeah, I agree. And I, I think it could be. I mean, I've never really analyzed it this far. I've only got a... Uh, actually... I had two guitars here in in the house that were a floating bridge. I had um, the Line Six Variax. It's a JTV eighty nine F. Actually, Oz Fox has one of those. Okay. Uh, so it's yeah, got, yeah. yeah, it's got the uh, the Variax system in a Floyd, which is really really cool. It's a it's the um, uh, Graph Tech uh, Floyd. So it's very very cool. Yeah. And then uh, my Kramer that um, I've got actually Al Johns here from from Gibson Kramer Epiphone in the chat as well too. Oh, Al, yeah. yeah, I've been in contact with him recently a lot. Nice, yeah, he's he's, he's glad to see you here. Um, I got the vintage Kramer vintage uh, 2015 vintage uh, Pacer Imperial. That's the word I'm looking for. And it came from the factory with floating, and I kept it floating for a while. And then one day I thought, you know what? No, I just, I want to change this one. I dropped it. I dropped it down, made it flush, and I popped a D tuna on it, and, and I yep. love it. And the same thing I was going to do with the 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 Variax. I was going to fix the bridge on that one with like a trem stopper, and I thought, no, you know what? This is really cool. It is nice to have that that different bridge, and I do play a little differently on it. It's I, I don't really pick up the guitar and analyze. Okay, here's how I have to play. I just know what to play, but it is nice to have a variance like that, you know, and and one yeah. one floating, one one flush. I tell you what, I don't like though is I don't like changing strings on a Bigsby. You ever done that? No, don't don't. I don't think it's so. not a fun project. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you. I kind of felt bad too because you know I've been playing guitar for thirty some odd years, and yeah. you know I I I'm not the world's best luthier, I, and I'm not the best repair person. But Me I can neither. I can solder pickups. I can put in a pot and I can solder it. I can do the average set, you know, decent setup to get my guitars to play the way I like them. I really wouldn't want to set someone else's guitar up because you know I'd be afraid of doing damage to it or just you know they're yeah. not going to like it, right? I just know how to, I like my stuff. So I thought, you know, it's my son's guitar. He's got an Eastwood Airline, beautiful guitar, kind of like a, you see like what the old ones, like, you know, Jack White from White Stripes, he'd play one. And, uh, you know, very George Jetson retro looking guitar, right? Yeah. And it's got a Bigsby on it. And I thought, oh, I've changed Floyd's, I've changed this, I've changed that. How hard is it going to be to change strings on a Bigsby? And it turned out to be a two-hour project. So my my uh, ego, if, if you want to say I had an ego, was crushed. Like literally crushed. Like and I'm thinking, like I'm in front of my 12 year old son. I'm looking like I don't know a thing about guitar. I, uh. I I cut all the strings off, and then I'm figuring, how do I do this, man? And uh, I watch videos on the internet, and the, the very first video I watch it says, step number one, don't take off all the strings at the same time. <laughs> so I'd already uh, cut them all okay. off. It was, and then when I when I got him back on, 
when I would press the whammy bar down, it would raise the pitch. So I had him on backwards. Oh, wow. It's so embarrassing. Long story short, it's not something if you've never done it before, it's not an easy job. Once I've done it now, I could do it in five minutes, no problem. Because you got to go yeah. around and it's like there's little pegs on, on the back kind of cam and you put the ball yeah. on that peg. It, it looks easy in theory, but yeah. oh, it's just it's just crazy. It really is. Um, there's another question yeah. here as well too. So that was from Joe on uh, on Tremolos. Uh, Will Varela says, hey, Eric, this is why I watch your channel. You introduced me to new music gear and musicians. Can you ask Ethan what got him started in guitar playing? That's a great question. It was some, something similar we had on our list, so I'll, I'll give uh, Will the credit for that one. So how did you get into it? And uh, when did, you started at 12, right? Yeah. 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 Tell us a little uh, bit about the background. Yeah. That I remember very vividly. It, it was, um, I have to credit Iron Maiden for that. Nice. I, um, you know, my, let's see. Um, oh, so I grew up in Israel. Mm -hmm. And um, I I started um, buying Iron Maiden shirts. That's actually how how it started because it they just looked the coolest. So I didn't even know that it was actually a band or anything like that. <laughs> I was just a kid. This was like being ten or eleven years old or something, and I I just thought those those shirts with you know Eddie on them were were amazing um and then like i remember older people always like stopped me in the street and, and pointed at my shirt and i'm like whoa cool iron maiden and then they would ask me like do you listen to them and i'm like no you know i was, <laughs> it was just a kid i didn't even know what they were talking about but just like cool and, right what's that it just looked cool you know the shirt yeah, was cool it just looked cool yeah and then um my older brother I went through his cassette collection at the time and I found a cassette of Number of the Beast and, you know, it just looked like, you know, same cover as one of my shirts. And I'm yeah. like, oh, there it is, you know. And um, I remember my uh, my friend, my neighbor was with me and he was telling me like, it was like, you want to listen to that? That's That's heavy metal. And I'm like, ooh. I like the sound of that. <laughs> so I popped it in and I listened to it over and over again. And I really liked Number of the Beast. And then I asked one of my other friends, like, so that sound, how did they make it sound? Now, how did they make, they make it sound like this? And he goes like, I'm pretty sure that's an electric guitar. And I'm like, hmm. I was gotta, like, gotta get one and of that those. was it. That was really the moment that I'm like, okay, I know what I have to get now. And that was it. And then um, at the time, you know, there was always that stupid myth out there and it still exists today mm -hmm. that um, parents always think that you have to start on a acoustic guitar, classical guitar before you pick up the electric guitar. I don't know whoever came up with that myth. It doesn't really make any sense to me. It never made any sense to me. But, you know, my parents heard it from somebody else sure. and they thought the same way. And they're like, well, if we buy you an electric guitar and an amplifier and it's so expensive, what if you quit right away? And like, so I'm like, all right, well, I'll do what I got to do. So I started playing classical guitar and I played that for about a year before I got to have my electric and um, it was it actually ended up being um, being kind of a blessing because uh, even though I was so impatient to have an electric guitar, um, I really kind of fell in love with classical guitar as well. And that's something that I continued playing later on, and I still enjoy doing it no nowadays. And even my style of electric guitar playing um, these days is very um influenced by that because um the one thing that i was kind of a natural at mm -hmm. was finger picking oh good um yeah and e e everything else i had to really work very hard on i was i was never never really a, a natural in in anything else i would i really had to work really hard on everything else music wise 
But the one thing that came kind of easy for me was was finger picking. And nowadays, the more the more time goes by, the more I actually just play fingers and a lot less with the pick. Oh wow! And, and I um and I switch between the two very quickly. I kind of tuck in tuck in my uh, my pick mm-hmm. underneath my middle finger, and I have a, a technique where I switch between the pick and finger picking very quickly. And nowadays, whenever I play lead guitar. Um, there's a lot of techniques that I use to pick and a lot of techniques where I just uh, play with fingers and I get to have a much bigger variety of different sounds and different type of phrasing that I can achieve with two different techniques. So, Well, that's very cool. So that was something that obviously that did come more natural for you and has kind of uh, evolved your sound. Evolved over time. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. And it keeps evolving nowadays. Yeah. Oh, that's very cool. uh, See, I didn't know you had a brother as well. So I I just knew about you and Neely. Um, How many how many brothers and sisters, uh, the three of you or is there more? Um, I have uh, my my sister and I, we have two older brothers, too. Okay, Um, they're not musicians. That's going to ask. Yeah. Yeah, but but we're all very close. That's good to know. It, here's yeah. here's something I th- I thought would be a fun discussion as well too, because in every family, you know, there's always sibling rivalry. You know, maybe one one the one of the brothers is a famous baseball player or just a good baseball player, and you got someone else that's trying to you know is always in the brother's shadow or or whatever. Yeah. So you, yeah. you both you both of you and uh, Neely are really really good guitar players, um, Thank you. and you know that's that's people just know that. But was there ever any competition between you two, friendly or not a non-friendly? Um, yeah, and I think that you know it's still to a certain extent going on even nowadays. Mm-hmm. You know, it's something where you know the the music business and like and what it is, it's it's very competitive, and there's really not a lot of room for a lot of people. Um, and um, yeah, it is competitive, but I always try to keep in mind that you know family comes first, and um, and all that other stuff is really you know doesn't even compare to you know to being a family. So yeah, exactly. It's not you know I mean it, it is there that rivalry or whatever, but those things are they don't mean that much. Good, so. good, healthy competition is always good. I suppose so too. Yeah. You know, you always try to better yourself, and you always try to reach out to the next level. And mm-hmm. yeah, and sometimes that, that that is a motivation for sure. That's right. And it has been a motivation to my sister, I'm sure, and, and to me as well. Yeah, that's right. And you've both both had great careers. You've both played with amazing people. So you know, you've you've both shared uh, amazing spotlights. I, I'd say so, and uh, hopefully it'll only continue getting bigger and bigger from here on out. That's up. right, and it's it's nice too because as as soon as you get successful, um, you know something comes up for her. As soon as something comes up for her, like it's a family name, so they know that name a lot of times, and that brings some credibility as well too. Like a lot, both of you could pretty much do just about anything you want on um, because of what you're both actively participating in the music business, right? You're, you're there, you're you're both a force, and I think that goes a long way too. Yeah, and that's something that, you know, I'm realizing over the years because this is something that nobody really has, you know. It's like, and the fact that it's a brother and sister and not a brother and a brother. Yeah, or sister yeah. And sister, you know, this is something that's very unusual. And I haven't seen another brother and sister who will play that kind of um, electric guitar playing. So I do recognize that this is something that people kind of find interesting. And um, at some point, I suppose that we'll have to do something with it. You Mm -hmm. know, uh, this is something that a lot of people find cute for some reason. (laughs) (laughs) It's nice. It's it's a nice, a nice thing to market as well, too. It's got it's got some, you know, appeal to it. Right. I guess so. Yeah. yeah. I guess nowadays you just have to have some kind of an appeal. I guess just playing guitar is not enough. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. Um, Will says, uh, Eric, when I was growing up in New York, everyone sold acoustic guitars. They were cheap and easy to pick up. He says that was the the 50s and 60s. And I agree with you. I've worked in music retail as well, too, uh, for, for many mm-hmm. years, probably about 10 years. So I saw that firsthand. I saw the, you know, the parents saying, we're going to start you off on acoustic. And I think yeah. I've maybe even, uh, I think I've even been that way as well, too. Um, but yeah, I, I do agree with that. So we'll jump back to the chat here for a second. As I mentioned, Eljan is here uh, saying, good to see oh. you, Ethan. Yeah. Uh, Alessandro, I'm going to probably pronounce this name wrong. Alessandro Moralva, I think. Uh, I'll do my best to pronounce that. Uh, jumping in. Thank you so much for tuning in. A lot of new people here today, and we greatly appreciate you coming in, spending part of your afternoon with us. Um, uh, Derek Merrill is here saying hello, everyone. Uh, Coffee Lover, um, that's Brian Cazell. He's a huge Michael uh, Sweet fan, a Striper fan, and uh, he was my, the one that pointed out um, to me about you playing on his record, so i got to give him credit for that. He's a, a big fan. Oh, uh, who's that? Uh, he goes by Coffee Lover on YouTube, but Brian Cazell. Coffee Lover. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and then we have... Uh few things in common then <laughs> that's right that's right uh gary davlin is here as well too uh let me see here uh, nocturnal saying if you have any questions for either ethan or myself please uh just shout out and we'll be happy to ask the questions uh let me see zach thong is here as well tony fuentes oh this is good this is a very good question from tony he says who are your three most influential guitarists and why Ooh, wow can i do five <laughs> <laughs> sure go ahead please yeah i mean there's uh and it's a lot more than five. I mean, there's so many guitar players that I stole from. I mean, um, inf- was influenced by. Um, I would say. I mean, George Lynch is a uh, is a huge influence of mine. Uh, I, I guess for me, you know, just the, the sound that George Lynch like the, the sound that comes out of his fingers. He just makes the guitar scream on every note. And to me, that's really, that is really the true sound of heavy metal, the way that it's supposed to be played, you know? And, um, and very few players really have that. Um, and just like his, his phrasing and uh, the stuff that comes out of his mind is just incredible, you know? It's just... Uh, it's so unique. It's so different. It's so, um, I don't even know where it comes from. It's just, uh, it's not, it's not the typical pentatonic phrases that you would expect in, in rock music. You know, it's just like he, he works purely on instinct and it just, it's so artistic and it's so creative that he's a, he's a huge influence on me. And, um, and then um, there, there's just so many players. There's J.K. Lee that, you know, song Bark at the Moon really changed my life. You know, the first time that I sure. saw it, it just, um, I was flipping through the channels on, uh, on my TV and I, I landed on MTV in the middle of the solo for Bark at the Moon. And I was like, what the hell is this? And um, I just couldn't wait till the end of the song to see, like, who the artist was, you know. And then I was, like, seeing Ozzy Osbourne bark at the moon. And I just kept saying it to myself not to forget what it what it was. Yeah. Just so I could find it later on right. somehow. And, um, you know, that song was, like, just that one song was such an influence on me because all the rhythms in that song and, and all the souls in that song – just pretty much cover everything in heavy metal. So if you learn that song really well, you just learned everything you need to know about heavy metal. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, so Jake has been a huge influence on me. Obviously, in the Malmsteen, you know, I mean, I've tried really hard over the years to not copy in the Malmsteen too much because there's so many guys that made a career over you know, yeah. imitate in the mom's team. And, um, and they never sound like him. You know, he's like, he's really the originator and he's like, like there's nobody like him. Um, and the intensity that he plays with, uh, um, and what he has done to the guitar world. is just incredible. So, 
he's a huge influence on me and, and uh, even songwriting wise you know he had a lot of records that had a lot of great songs that he's I think he's very underrated as far as being a songwriter mm-hmm. um, he had a lot of great catchy songs and he made a lot of great albums and um, despite um, of despite what people criticize him for um, you can't take away from him what what he brought to the table and how you know he set the bar um, so Inva is another huge influence on me um, I would say um, Nuno is another one Nuno is uh, somebody who has uh, pretty much the best sense of rhythm and groove uh, I don't know what it is and how like he he was born with like a gift that you know very few other people have and um, he brought something also very very unique to the table and uh, when you listen to Porno Graffiti that album uh, like top to bottom it's just like a guitar school in and of itself it is know? Yeah, it's it's insane, and there's so much different guitar playing on it, um, so many different elements, and um, and Nuno is um, is also like such a great performer, and he has the perfect rock and roll guitar player look. He does, you know? um, and that's something that I think is very important. You know, it's part of the the whole package. That's right. You know? and, um, so he's a big influence. Um, and then obviously Adrian Smith from Iron Maiden, that, um, elegance of guitar playing is so, so amazing. And all the, all the songs that he wrote for Maiden and it's just, and the tones and the different, um, like the different sounds on every record that, you know, just sounded like a completely different world. Um, it's, uh... Yeah, it's it's amazing. There's cer- just so cer- many. Certainly a yeah, great list of guitar players. I mean, that, that's a that's a good list. That's a good list of inspiration yeah. for sure. And another guy that I have to credit is is Greg Howe too. Okay. Greg, Greg Howe is just um, that I was fortunate enough to like years ago take lessons from him too, and like and actually being getting taught by him of some of like how he actually creates that magic. He's a uh, is one of the most sophisticated guitar players and he's just like his his touch on the instrument and his approach and everything that he does is just so um mind blowing. Um so definitely another great player and uh I mean but there's so many, you know, not, there's Tommy Emmanuel who's just Oh yeah. Ridiculous. Where do you even start with him? You know, and then there's all the flamenco guys that I love, you know, like Paco de Lucia and Vicente Amigo and like insane guys there. And then um, there's all like there's Marty Friedman, you know, his record Dragon's Kiss was just like the best instrumental record ever. And then, of course, Jason Becker and not to even touch on Eddie Van Halen and what <laughs> he did. So, I mean. It just the list goes on and on and on. That's a great list, and I think that also shows the talent that you have because of this wide, eclectic, multi-genre style of uh, music that you listen to. And I'm really glad you mentioned Jason Becker too, because there's a question been waiting here for me from Joe Hervey. Um, we've had Jason on the show a couple times. We've had him on, oh, uh, yeah, New Year's Eve both times, which is great. We kind of rang in the uh, New Year with Jason Becker, and it was great. And it was so funny. Um, the I one time, I remember that. Yeah. yeah, I didn't even realize this is the show. That mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, this is that yeah. one. He's been. It was really cool. And you know, he, he had me crying, like literally crying on, and in a good way, in a positive way. Yeah. You know, like you, the, speaking with Jason Becker. I mean, one of the world's most inspiring uh, men out there. Just people, inspiring people. And he's like oh. doing that's what she said jokes. You know what I mean? And like, I mean, like oh, you don't yeah. expect that from Jason Becker. But um, and I know your sisters met Jason, but Joe says um, I met. Too. Yeah, good because he asked us. Ethan never met Jason by chance, so. Oh. Um. Yeah, this was uh, this was really amazing for me. This was like I think, back in 2012 or something. Okay. Um, my friend Max Dybel, uh, who's a great guitar player, 
Um, he was, uh, I think for a long time, he was working on transcribing Perpetual Burn. Um, so he was in contact with Jason and he, he's also from, um, uh, from San Francisco himself. So, um, he knew Jason and, um, we went one day to meet Jason Becker and we went to his home and, um, it, it was, it was amazing because we knocked on the door one afternoon and, um, and I was so nervous because, you know, here I am, I'm just about to meet Jason Becker, the guy that I've listened to for God knows how many years. And um, they, they, somebody opens the door for us and we go in and my friend just goes like, hey, Jason, I got to go pee. And he just leaves me like that. Oh, man. <laughs> and I'm like. <laughs> Thrown. Wow. And, and I'm like right in front of Jason Becker and Jason's on, on his chair and it's just him and I and I'm like and my heart is pumping and I'm like I don't even know how am I going to speak yeah well what, what am I even going to say <laughs> you know oh. like um and Jason was there with his dad and um and I just like I went up to him and I just started telling him what you know what kind of an inspiration he was to me um, always, not even just musically, mm -hmm. but life, you know, just like, yeah, it's like, can you think of a stronger human being than Jason Becker? I can't. No. It, you know, so, um, so within like the first 30 seconds that I'm there, he starts uh, communicating with his eyes and his dad is uh, translating mm -hmm. and he goes, uh, he goes like PL. A Y, and then G U I T A R N O W. It goes like play guitar now, and I'm oh, like, oh man, oh, okay. <laughs> Probably so, the most pressure you've ever had in your life at that moment. Yeah, it's like I'm still really nervous from <laughs> um, just being in the same living room with Jason sure. Becker, and I already have to sit there and and play something for him, so. <laughs> uh, this is something guitar players will appreciate. So I, I go and like he has all these guitars on his wall. Beautiful guitars. And, of course, yeah. Um, and then I go and I grab the guitar from the cover of his first record, of Perpetual Bird. Okay. And I was like, can I use that one, Jason? And he's like, yeah, yeah, you can use whatever you want. And, um, and so the action on the guitar... It was quite this high. Like this high. Oh, no. And the string, oh, no. you know, he lives in California, you know, and like yeah. it, it, the, all the strings are rusty as hell. You know, it's not like somebody's changing strings there on all the guitars every day. Yeah. So the strings are so rusty from the humidity or whatever. And, um, and then I was warned by other guitar players before that. And they said like, you know, the, the amp that Jason has there, is a is not a very forgiving amplifier, so it does not Compensate. sound good. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, I was like, eh, how bad can it be? Oh you boy! Know? Never ask that question. Like I've played on so many different amps. You know, I teach in a in a like a small studio where there's just like a tiny little Pract fender. Practice amp, yeah. yeah and, I, and I usually I, I have no problem playing through those amplifiers. You know. Sometimes I enjoy playing through amps like that. So I'm like, ah, it's not going to be that bad. And um, I sit I sit on this couch right in front of Jason, and it's like he has yeah, – I bet nobody's telling you stories like that, but he has one of these couches where it kind of swallows you. Oh, no. <laughs> so like, you, the guitar is probably up to your armpits now. Like yeah, it's kind of like you yeah. sit like that, and uh, <laughs> the guitar is like – you know, like is on you in like a weird position. Yeah. And I plug into this amplifier, and uh, and I start playing something, and it has like zero gain. Oh no! Like, and I'm like, Th that can't be right. I'm like, this is the gu guitar amp that Jason Beck <laughs> has here. It's like one of the world's greatest shredders of all time, and that's the amp that he. 
I cannot believe it. And I'm still really nervous. This is all happening within the first minute oh. of me walking in there. Um, so the first, the first few seconds of it were really embarrassing. I gotta admit that was like, I don't know. It was real. I, I didn't know how to like get out of that situation. And then I, I decided to just play something that I was familiar with, you know, not yeah. to try and improvise in the like the, the most stressful situation. And I just played like whatever solo I used to play um, back then at my live shows. And um, and then so I started getting more comfortable as time went on. And then I could start seeing he, Jason smiling, you know, and like because despite his condition and the fact that he cannot move any muscle in his body, somehow you still see the expressions on his face. Yeah. It's very, um, you can totally tell, you know, if he's, uh, if he's joking, if he's smiling, if he's in pain, you, you can tell all those things. Um, so I started getting, getting a really good vibe from him and I got more comfortable and then I saw that he really dug it, you know, and to me that was just like such a, such a big compliment. Um, and, and, and then, you know, we, we just kept hanging out and my friend and I and, and Jason and we're just sitting together in his living room and then we're just talking about guitar players and how much the 90s sucked and all kinds of stuff <laughs> yeah. like that and you just realize he's the same exact guy that he was before he had ALS and he's just another cool guitar player with long hair that is still the same guy and it's just like that guy is just amazing well, looking back at that, yeah. I, I know that was probably, it'd be like me, like I've met Eddie Van Halen a few times, but I've never had the opportunity to play in front of him, nor would I ever, probably ever want to. That, yeah. I, I just don't <laughs> think I could do a, I couldn't play a single thing and I would be judging myself so bad. But I think the great thing about this is that's probably something that you could take. You might not think about this when you're doing a gig, you know, a big festival or a big, you know, arena or whatever. You might not think about it directly about that moment, but it's knowing the fact that you can get, if you've got through that, you can get through anything. Because, I mean, you're meeting yeah. your, your idol, you're put on the spot, you're playing rusted strings, you're playing something that's so out of your comfort zone and amplify, yeah. gain all that stuff. Sitting in a couch where, like you said, swallowing you up. I mean, really, what else could have gone wrong? Everything went wrong, except yeah. you made Jason smile at the end. So, in the grand scheme of things, you made it, it was all it was all worth it. But I think that's that's like military training for a person as as a musician or a performer, entertainer of any kind to get through that. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. That's very cool. Yeah. So that's a great story. We've never had that story told to us as far as uh, you know. I we, we've heard Nita Strauss when she's on the show. She told us her story about meeting Jason and you know, kind of a, a pressure situation as well too, where her boyfriend just yeah. showed up and says, "Okay, we're going to this house, whatever." So that's that's pretty crazy, but uh, a great inspiration for sure. We love Jason. For sure. Oh yeah, totally. He was totally. on the show, and he, when the second time he came on, he was playing some of his music, and this was was so funny. We talk about copyright strikes. You know, that was a big hot topic for people for a while on the internet. You know, it's like everyone was getting copyright strikes. I got a copyright strike on my show that day with Jason Becker playing his own music. Oh really? Yeah, they were they were actually playing some music. Yeah. Uh, they were showing us some of the um, unreleased David Lee Roth stuff. And uh, so it was pretty pretty cool. We're getting to hear some David Lee Roth tunes and stuff like that. And totally. we got a copyright check. I'm like, this is hilarious. And it was actually Jason. We just we didn't argue it. It was we just let it go. Um, wow. But here's more questions here from the uh, the chat as well too. And I'm gonna say hi to a bunch more people in a second. Island Sounds um, has a question for Ethan uh, for you. He says, uh, "What was the one guitar technique that was the most difficult for you to perfect or get comfortable with?" Now you talked about uh, being finger picking came naturally to you. Um, mm -hmm. On the flip side of that, what was something that was, as he asks, uh, what was the hardest to learn? Um, Maybe like sweet well, picking or anything? The, or What's that? Like sweet picking, that's something I can't do. Is that, is that something that came hard for you or just maybe the hardest technique? See, I, I would an answer this question in a slightly different way. Okay. Um, the, the thing is, you can take any technique and repeat it a million times over and 
when you repeat something over and over again, you can just like take one phrase like that and master it. And it almost becomes easy when you uh, just repeat it over and over again. What I find hard and what I find harder than any one technique is to actually switch between many different techniques very quickly. Because if you want to improvise on, in real time, and if you want to sound interesting and not just play something over and over again, you know, there's a, there's a lot of guys that can play really fast and they're only playing two licks with alternate picking the whole night. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it ends up getting easy and it, it starts becoming boring to listen to. Um, I want to just have as much variety of different sounds and different music um, to my plane, that's really what I'm after. And I mean, sweep picking, you know, again, if you s sweep the same A minor sweep a thousand times in a row, it's boring. Yeah, it's boring and it's going to become easy at some point. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you're improvising in real time in a high, high pressure situation when you're playing live and there's a lot of there, um, like a variety of different things around you that you're not expecting and you still have to be in the zone and think about something creative and improvise and you go between different different scales and, and different phrasing and then you just have to just go to a different technique all of a sudden um, and keep going back and forth between different things. That is actually what's really difficult. Um, so... I don't know as far as just one particular technique that's more difficult than than another. Um, I don't know. Sometimes just plain alternate picking when the volume knob is too close to you and you have yeah. to find a, like a position to like go around it. Um, but it has to be with like. I wouldn't even say one particular technique. It's maybe like certain phrases that just give you a really hard time just because of the nature of the phrase itself. That okay. sometimes you just come across something that the picking is really weird, you know, like you'll have to do like uh, two notes on one string, then one note on another, then three notes on another string, and then you just have to learn the picking specifically for that one phrase. And that that one phrase can just like drive you crazy for 20 years because you have to keep playing that at every show or whatever. So uh, agreed, agreed. there's those kind of things. Yeah. A good sense of yeah. rhythm is good to know as well too. And this kind of leads into the one other question here. I think this is from Island Sounds as well. It says one more question. Uh, with so much focus on playing lead these days, what's the best way to, for players to become equally great at rhythm playing? And I know you mentioned this on your website. You talk about on your, uh, you talk about your guitar lessons that you um, have available for people to purchase they can sign up for and you say it's one thing to build you know just build shred like the best of them but there's there's other things that are important too like being able to come up with a good song good songwriting skills and yeah. uh, the topic we talk about when we talk about Eddie Van Halen here on the show a lot is we analyze it's easy to see Eddie Van Halen as one of the world's greatest lead guitar players but he, oh, yeah. if the average people don't give him the credit, like the diehard fans will give him credit for this, but the people that don't know Eddie Van Halen from, you know, a, a full history, they don't know how good his rhythm skills are. And oh, yeah. probably, you know, I can, he did, he did. And arguably, probably his rhythm playing is even better than his lead playing. If that's hard, it's hard to believe, but it's kind of true. So I guess what his question he's asking here is what's a good way to balance, you know, to be able to get your rhythm chops up uh, to speed too? like any, any suggestions you could give, um, you know, maybe metronoming or any people that you would want to listen to anything you could share. Um, I would say um, one advice that I give most of my students um, is especially nowadays, you want to take, a record that's you know a really great record like you take porno graffiti for example mm -hmm. you know nuno who's an insane rhythm player and um learn the whole learn the whole record start to finish by ear and avoid any of the avoid any cheating by uh not not looking at a million videos on youtube of people showing you how to do it okay actually go through the agony 
of um, of learning everything your way by ear and do it with a whole record. And if it takes you a year to do it, then spend a year doing it. Um, but you will learn so much and you will see that most of the time you're actually playing rhythm and more than, than you're playing lead. Of course. And, and you will, you will figure it out. And, uh, and to me, that's the best way because you will learn a lot about songwriting and song structures. And, um, and you will learn a lot about lead playing and you will be developing your ear and will be developing your technique and the problem is nowadays, and that's what I see with a lot of uh, the young kids at Berkeley, for example, um, like I'll walk in there and I'll see some kid that I see for the first time and he'll be playing like some 12 finger tapping or something, you know, mm -hmm. and do some crazy looking stuff like that. And then when I ask him to like go from like E to a C chord to power chords, they're like, Oh, um, yeah, I know. How do I do that? And I'm like, got to be kidding me. Yeah, I know. So there's, there's a problem with uh, when you just have so many sources out there and everything is so disorganized and you're so easily distracted and you just immediately from day one, you jump to like the highest, uh, most difficult techniques. And then there's nothing on the bottom of that. You know, and you're only working on one type of guitar playing yeah. that is really not what you're going to be doing most of the time. Um, there's there's an issue with that. And I think that nowadays it's like everything is so overly saturated with so much information, but it's bits and pieces of information that that is usually out of context. Yeah, yeah. And a and, lot of the information is wrong and you're getting it from multiple sources. Yeah. So it's like... You better just find a great teacher who really gets it and actually go through a whole process of many different things that many different sides that your plane has to uh, be about. And uh, but one way of doing it is just like the old school way that all these great guitar players did it. They they took their favorite record. And they listened to it over and over and over again, and they transcribed everything off of it, you know, many, many times over, and um, and took forever to do it. So just just do that. Learn a whole record, start to finish, and you will see how much better of a guitar player you become. That's one of the that. that's one of the best pieces of advice we've ever got on the show, and I've never thought about it until now. And what it kind of reminds me of, and this here again, it shows my age as well too. I'll ask you a quick question: Do you play video games at all? Me? Yeah. Do you play any video games? Um, I used to when I was a kid. Okay. And, uh, well, here's here's yeah. here's the reason I'll why still I still play the old ones from back then. Okay. Well, here's the reason why I ask, because see, that's the thing with guitar playing today: we have an instrument of any kind, drums, guitar, uh, keyboard, whatever you want to play. We go to YouTube, we go get our tablature for our guitar, we watch 15 different videos on how to play uh, Sweet Child of Mine or Eruption or whatever, and everybody's got a one little piece of that's bang on right, and then there's parts that are wrong. So we're consuming yeah. all this in information, some good, some bad, but we've had to watch 15 or 20 videos to piece all of it together to make one complete, accurate instruction. Back in the day, I remember as a kid with video games, this is the same thing, because now we watch... We watch PewDiePie play the latest video game, and we watch all these people. Here's how you. Here's a walkthrough how to beat the boss in the video game. Whereas no, back in the day, we didn't have that. And no. I remember the biggest in, uh, kind hey, of. You know how much money I spend on the ar arcade, and just like I would die in the first ten seconds. Sure, you know? sure. And it was fun, right? You're mad, yeah. but it was fun. That's how you learn. And I can remember when the, the biggest thing came out back then was you could call Nintendo, you know, the 1-800 number, or actually 1976 or something. You had to pay a minutely or, you know, yeah, I pay by the minute. Yeah, how do I beat the, the big Koopa boss, King Bowser, you know, when I get to level blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, and that was groundbreaking technology for us back then. So, I didn't even know about that. Yeah, That's there was there was a one. Awesome. Uh, yeah, it used to be in the in the manual or somewhere. If you actually you would join the Nintendo uh, Power Club, I think they called it. God, I can't believe I remember that. And yeah, yeah. Uh, you could call and you could talk to somebody, and they'd be you know giving you cheats, eh? But long story short, what I was trying to make the comparison was that maybe we should do that. Maybe we should do go old school and just focus on that record. Let's skip the skip the cheat sheets and focus yeah. on it. Yeah. 
Good advice. Because, you know, I, I'm seeing, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of talented kids out there. There is. Um, you know, I mean, it's not that humans 30 years ago were more talented than, hu- than humans now. You know, it's, it's not any different. That's right. But I feel like a lot of the younger kids nowadays, they're it, with all the resources that they have, in a way, it's it's misguided, you yeah. know, because you can see one guitar player, young guitar player, playing an incredible tune, one tune that sounds amazing, uh, with all the techniques, you know. But then again, if they were in a different situation where it, they had to play a full gig and learn a whole set of material and do all kinds of improvisation and stuff like that, they would be totally lost. I agree. You know, it, it's uh, like with technology it, changing so much for us, like I, I hate to see it come to, to a point where, I mean, we all want to get somewhere fast. We, if someone wants to lose weight, they, you know, they don't want to do the workouts. They want to just take a pill and want everything to be like, they want it now. Right. Yeah. And I don't want to see, you know, musical talent get to the point where it's like the matrix. See, if you watch the matrix movie, you know, the, the, the one girl needs to be, needs to know how to fly the helicopter. Right. So yeah. they, they just, they teach her how to be a helicopter pilot in two seconds. Right. So we, yeah. you know, we could make an Ingve Malmstein in two seconds sometime and with technology, but what has that done for the person? What did they actually learn? Now they can just play like Ingve Malmstein. But were they playing in clubs? Or they were they, you know, like all these different kinds of environments, yeah. like good things and bad things that happen to a musician over their life to get to where they are. That shaped yeah. them. You can't you can't yeah. fast forward that. No, you can't. You really can't. You know, even if you can kind of fake one Inva Malmsteen lick on YouTube and play it fast, that will not make you Inva Malmsteen. You you only be, become Inva Malmsteen by devoting your whole entire life and all your time and all your effort and all your money and all your blood, sweat and tears to, to become that. And even then there is definitely not a guarantee you're going to be in the mom's team because there is very few people who can, who can do that. Yeah, I agree, I agree with you on that hundred percent. There's a question here too, if I can, if I can read it correctly, uh, Chris Ferris says, say hello to my dear old friend and vocalist from my garage band, Ken Pittman. Uh, for me, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, very cool. And let me see. This there is some technology. Um, there's some technology stuff here as well. And so this... by the way, uh, it's my uh, my singer, and we have a Bon Jovi tribute that we do a lot of local shows here. Oh, that's in the cool. US, and we have a lot of a lot of fun with that. And I play my Kramer guitars uh, with that band. And um, and uh, Ken Pittman, that singer, he's uh, he's the biggest diehard Van Halen fan. So that yeah. that is way cool well, that that's a great to hear about that and obviously with the kramer stuff as well that's that's fun i'm not sure if you got a chance to see this sometime when you get some downtime i had um several of the kramer founding fathers on the show here because I, I actually started a new show called kramer corner uh and oh. I, I really really got to put some fire under that show this year i, I got a little lazy with it i'm not going to make an excuse i just got was i run four different shows and uh, okay. I, I do one for line six helix and i do one for walking dead as well too which is kind of cool called rocking dead yeah. But I had um, on the Kramer Corner show, Al John from, from Gibson was on the show. Um, and Phoenix uh, Vander Vaden, uh, she was on the show. She's a big fan of yours as well, too. But I had Gary Kramer himself. I actually was at his, his home. And we oh, had wow. Dennis Berardi and Henry Vaccaro Sr. on the show, too. It was so cool getting the perspective from these founding fathers. You know, and yeah. each one with a little bit different stories. And, you know, we get a little older in life and we kind of forget some things. And they were forgetting a few things each. But it was so cool. You know, I'm going to do a, a lot more things with Kramer um, in the years to come. Good. And uh, I've been playing Kramers for a long time. And it's, um, it's another hidden, like almost forgotten treasure that needs to uh, be brought back to the guitar world in a, in a big way. I agree. Uh, Is, and with Gibson yeah. doing it now, at least we've got a company with some power, uh, you know, a nice new structure, um, you know, yeah. to, to really, I, I honestly think they're in the good and very good hands. Yeah. And I, I think that now it seems like in the last year or so, um, it, at least in my opinion, it looks like they're uh, maybe taking it even more seriously and kind of like wanting to invest more in Kramer than they did initially. So mm. I think maybe now is the right time to actually, have Kramer make a huge comeback. 
I think so too. There's a lot of players playing them, a lot of uh, champions raising the, you know, waving the flag for Kramer. So I, I think there's good things, as you say, to come for sure. And and uh, Aljon, having right people at the company that not only um, believe in the product, they believe in the players, they're listening to the players, they want the feedback from players, what makes a good guitar. So that's that's awesome. Uh, very, very yeah. good stuff. Um, and so this is a question coming in from Dust Devil. And this was uh, some, some uh, notes I had as well too. So we're talking about gear here. And he's asking, does Ethan still play the uh, Theta Pro? Now, that's something yeah, you and, yeah. and uh, Michael were both endorsing. Uh, tell us how, how you got involved with ISP and if you're still using that. Absolutely, I am using that. I've been with ISP for about 12 years now. Nice. Uh, yeah, we're like family. And, um, I, you know, I, I mean, I've been very fortunate to uh, been working very closely with uh, with the guys in ISP. And um, uh, I, I'm fortunate that a lot of my input is all is also in the equipment itself. Um, some of my suggestions, and I've always been the first guy to test out these units on the road. Uh, even when I went on tour with Inver Malmsteen, um, I used uh, the Theta pedal and the Stolth, which is the the tiny power amp. Okay. That 180 watts stereo power amp that is about that that big and it's really light and um and that had to compete with Inver's wall of marshals oh for, my God. You know, for 25 shows and um and i was and those uh products weren't on the market yet mm -hmm. you know this was like a few months before they even um were were available so um i got to like road test like a lot of the gear every time there was a new product i would i would test it out and uh the same thing with the theta pro you know um and the theta pro i wrote some of the factory presets of that unit and um they they put uh, they they took some of my input about the design and implemented it but uh buck waller the guy who um owns isp he's um he was the owner of rocktron Okay. Uh, yeah. He was the founder of Rocktron. He yeah. owned Rocktron for about 20 years. And um, there's a whole long story of what happened to Rocktron. And he had to sell the company. And then he started ISP. And the guy is a genius engineer. And um, he makes pretty much the best sounding stuff. So, um, and that's why I play it. And we're very good friends. Um, and uh, yeah, it looks like uh, I might have my own signature pedal at some point with ISP pretty soon. Um, yeah, and uh, the Theta Pro is a great, great unit. It fits in your carry-on, mm -hmm. and it, that with the power arm, with the power amp, fits in your carry-on, and it's just a ginormous tone. I, I wouldn't even play anything else, so I don't even need all that huge stuff to to carry around um and it's something where i'm so used to that tone and i can just go anywhere to any venue and just plug it into whatever speaker cabinet or go straight to the board uh, or do both at the same time that's what i do a lot a lot too mm -hmm. where i um the audience gets mostly the direct sound that goes straight to the pa nice and stereo and everything and it just sounds like the real thing and um and then at the same time i'll i'll go and uh, feed the speaker cabinets and have that tone on stage right behind me and that that just rumbles the the floor you know and um it's, and it's that's so um that's awesome you get like the best of both worlds and that unit has like the best chorus i've ever heard it's oh nice just, it sounds so good um, so it's just like in one pedal press, I can instantly go to like this chimey, so like so beautiful, such a beautiful clean tone with chorus and delay and all that stuff, and then go back to like a, a massive rhythm tone and and just you know it's just so so much fun to use that on stage. It's like just, two independent uh, amplifiers, completely almost like a, like a Fender Twin to like a, 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 a Mesa or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really cool. I, I I didn't know the connection between Rocktron and I was a huge Rocktron fan back in the day. I've owned several of the Intellifex units, 
Oh, and, okay. And I love and I love their hush technology that they had back then, and they still do. But so like, that's cool. Well, they see that guy Buck. He renovated the whole, uh, revolutionized the whole hush technology that he came up with himself uh, early on. Okay. And he made it, he made the decimator that seems to be in everybody's rig now. That's yeah. And that's one of the most totally common. different technology, and it's much better. Um, and gotcha. the Intel effects, you know, there's some people that swear by some of the effects of that. I think even like Vivian Campbell mm -hmm. uh, in his rig, you know, with Def Leppard, he's got all those like X effects and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And he still has the Intel effects for the chorus. Isn't that know? something? So, yeah. Yeah. So, oh, very cool. That's good to know. Um, yeah. Let me see. I think there was another question that was funneled to me. If not, I'll go jump over back to the uh, the chat for a second. Um, let me see here. Krellbar is here. Chris Ferrer. I think I mentioned Chris. Richard Henry's jumping in. Says, "Hey guys, hey, Eric and uh, Ethan. Hope all is well with everyone." Uh, Rick Thank Hefner you. is here as well too. Uh, let me see here. Oh, I missed somebody, or I scrolled too fast. Uh, Ben's is here. Let me see here. Getting a great response Benz? from the chat. Yes. Um, let me just double check here. I know there is a question, and I scrolled too fast, and I lost it. Um, okay, so uh, Wolverine said, I'm not sure what the ISP does matter as noise reduction. Yes, that's the like a noise gate without really gating. What I was using for a while myself, too, for a bit, I was using the Boss NS2. That was a, a nice one as well, too. But um, with a high gain amplifier, you need you need that kind of thing. Uh, estimator is way better. I, I, I agree with you. I, I, I have never owned one, but I have heard... I honestly heard reviews of people saying that that's one of the go-to ones. It's like when you have a tuner, this is, you know, the default tuner, this is what you have. When you want a noise reduction, the, the decimator is the one that you want to have. So yeah. I, I agree on that for sure. Um, yeah. And uh, Death Devil saying the Theta Pro does have a great chorus and it's got the best crystal cleans too. So obviously familiar with yeah. it. That's very cool if you got it possibly down the road, a signature um, item coming out with them. That'd be, that's great. I mean, you know, you've kind of, made it to a level when you've got a piece of gear with your name on it, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. That's a, that's I, a very rewarding thing as a musician for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think, uh, I've been buying gear my whole life and been trying out different things for so many years. I, I think it's time for me to have, uh, something that I have, yeah. My own input into, yeah, you you've know. you've paid your dues and you've contributed a lot, and I think I think that's another reason too. This is a piece of advice I can sh I can share with other um, guitar players that are possibly seeking endorsements or working with companies. Something that you've done uh, that's really really good is the fact that you mentioned I didn't know you're with ISP for about twelve years, but yeah. that is loyalty. That's brand loyalty, and yeah. and there's I shouldn't say brand loyalty. There's a difference between brand loyalty. Because some people will just go to a company because they think it's a good brand. Um, that, that's not brand loyalty. Brand loyalty is being there, jumping in with a company on the bottom floor. And that's that's kind of where I've done with Kramer. I'm, I'm on the bottom floor with those guys. I'm on the roster, but I'm bottom floor. And I'm happy to be at the bottom floor and, and work my way up and, and prove loyalty, stay with them because yeah. Gibson's a nice company. <laughs> you, got it, you know what I mean? There's Kramer, mm -hmm. there's Epiphone, there's Gibson, all of that. You know, I want to come in and, you know, at the ground level like everyone else and work my way up. And it's important to do that because let's just say you go to Brand X, okay, and you're with Brand X and you play their guitars and they send you a guitar and you, and you play it. And then, you know, you say, you know, oh, if someone over here gave me a better offer, I'm going to jump. Well, guess what happens in this business? A lot of these, uh, um, you know, AR guys and girls out there, they move sometimes from company to company to company. Yeah. You burn your bridge yeah. over here with this company and you say your guitars suck and this one's a better one. Um, you're, you, that word's going to get out very, very quickly. These people network, they work for the same company sometimes. So yeah. loyalty I've is seen, important. I've seen that for years. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, if I really like something, if I genuinely, genuinely like a piece of equipment, you know, I will stick with it for a really long time. Mm -hmm. you know? and, um, I mean, there's, uh, you know, to be fair, there's other, there's other units, there's, there are other amps that sound good, you know, mm -hmm. and, and there's certain things that I would still you know, use in the studio. If something sounds good to me, I will, you know, take advantage of it, you know, and I'll tell you exactly my opinion about it. I'm not going to tell you that something is good if I don't think it's good. That's right. That's right. That's that's yeah. like, I used to do a lot of reviews on gear here on the channel, and I, and I just, 
I don't have the time for it anymore uh, is because I'm doing more of these interview type things, uh, you know, a situation where we get to just talk about all kinds of gear and guitar and all that kind of stuff. Yep. But that's people would come to me and they'd say, well, how come we don't ever see any negative reviews on your channel? You know, like any any gear that you think says sucks. I said, there is a bunch of people out there that do a really good job on that. They'll say, OK, I've got brand X and I've got brand Y. Uh, here's they, they do a shootout and then brand Y sucks. I like to say people at the time, if they come to my channel and I do a review, it's only going to be on a piece of gear that I've, I've had a chance to try and I won't yeah. do a review immediately. What I, when I, what I started to do is I even took it a step further. I want to make my reviews so honest and open to people that I would do them live. Would not even yeah. I, and so that I'm like I'm learning this piece. Usually when it's more like technology, not just a guitar, but it's some kind of technology, some kind of a processor or whatever. I, and I want to learn that on the fly. And uh, and if it works, which it always has, thank goodness it's it worked for me. That I can convey that if I can learn this in five minutes live with not even touching it, yeah. then you guys probably can too, right? But yeah. I, I, I've had people say, well, here, we'll send you this if you want to review it. And I'm like, I've, I'll research it a little bit. I'm like, I'm not going to be able to say anything good about this product. So, you know, and I'm, I'm polite about it. I'm like, I, I can't take your, your, you know, review at this time. I thank you yeah. and things like that. But it's better to be honest, I think. Absolutely. I, I'll tell you another thing. You know, if we talk about honesty about gear, like, for example, um, another piece of gear that I really like that, um, I've been loyal to for many years that if for a company that doesn't exist anymore is the all the Rockman stuff. The, the oh, yeah. Yeah. And R&D stuff. And I have a lot of that equipment and I've, um, I've used it a lot over the years for certain record, recordings. It has a tone that is so distinct and very different than anything else. Um, and it's not and i have a lot of criticism for it too because the, those pieces uh, those pieces of equipment they got a lot of um they're problematic in a way you know like using them live is something very tricky and if you have one rockman it's just a small piece of a big puzzle um and it's difficult to um, to really EQ it, to get to exactly what you want, what you want to hear. Um, so it's a difficult piece of gear to, to handle, but it has a very unique character that nothing else sounds, sounds like it. And, um, and I've used those products for many years, even though the company doesn't exist anymore, you know, and it's not like I'm, I need them to, you know, just give me publicity or anything like that. I just, you know, sometimes I use it because I, I just like it. That's right. Um, but, but then again, you know, for when it comes to live playing and what really works for me, I think the ISP Theta Pro is really what I want to play because um, it, I don't have to tap dance on, uh, on pedals and it gives me a ginormous tone and it gives me such uh, um, such a complex ability to EQ stuff and it's just it's a consistent um, learning process and just experimenting with just making the unit sound better and better and better it, it, it's a consistent trial and error mm -hmm. until you know like you, you never it, it you never reach the end of the possibilities with um, with the amount of EQ that you have on that unit, and that's really what separates that unit from from the other ones. It's just like how well you can shape your tone. Yeah, EQ is how, important, and sometimes it's so it's overlooked in in some processors for sure. Yeah, yeah and that's really what it's all about. That that is your tone. Yeah, well. I, I know Michael's using it and loving it and uh, on tour right now, second night of the tour, I think tonight. And, uh, you know, they're using that basically into a bass amp, into a bass head, into a cabinet. So clean, clean, clean amplifier. And it's doing all the work. So that's pretty cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I, I know so, no matter what the gear is. No, I've heard mil millions of good things about uh, ISP. But no matter what brand of thing you're playing, as long as you're playing your guitar and you're happy doing it, and there's some, some yeah. piece of technology or, or old school amplifiers that are making you happy to play, then who cares? That's yeah. that's the right thing because you're playing and having fun. So that's great. Absolutely. And I'll tell you another thing with um, with ISP. I mean, 
I got Steve Lynch uh, hooked on that too. Okay. Uh, from Autograph. Lynch He's been on the show. Yep. Yeah. A couple times. One of the originators of uh, the yeah. eight finger tapping, you yeah. know, and all that crazy stuff. And, and he loves it. He swears by it now. And, um, and then if you think about it also, uh, Ellen Holdsworth, mm -hmm. uh, when, when he passed away, the, the last unit that he was using on the road and in the studio was the Theta Pro. Really? That I did not know. No, his name comes up a lot in the show, obviously, with the you know relationship with Eddie Van Halen and how Eddie yeah. just you know was so enthralled with his playing. Uh, but I did not know that. That's very cool to know. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. Yeah, so he was... Um, Buck, the, the owner of ISP, also told me that um, he had him for a bunch of stuff uh, with Rock Drone back in the day. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was there, you know, at NAMM right next to Alan Holdsworth um, at the ISP booth, you know, two months before before he passed away. Mm -hmm. um, and he was there doing an autograph signing because, um, you know, that's what he was using at the time. That's very cool. I would have never known that. And I saw yeah. some of your clips from Nam as well too. Um, if, unfortunately, I never got a chance to meet you at Nam. I, I started going in 2017, um, but I never did get a chance to meet you. But uh, maybe another Nam for sure. As we get yeah. ready to wrap up here, um, we've got a, a comment from actually a question from Richard Henry. He's a monster guitar player, a friend of mine on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Uh, he says, uh, who are you digging at the moment? Any players? Like we, you mentioned some of the heroes that you have growing up that you really mm -hmm. like. But this could be, be a player or a band. He's asking who you're digging at the moment. Um, yeah, Satcho from Steel Panther. There you, and you have them on your record. Yes. You know, that's perfect. Yeah. it's a perfect thing because I wrote this down as a question and maybe we can end with this. So uh, that's probably a good answer for Richard. Um, the Conspiracy, is that the name of the newest record? Yeah. Tell, yeah. tell as we wrap up here. Tell fans uh, like obviously we can get it through your website. We have a link down below. But tell new prospective fans what they can expect from that record. Uh, this is my uh, my third record, and uh, as as they say, third time's a charm, and uh, I kind of <laughs> believe in that because uh, I think that I gained some experience with recording my first two albums, and I think this one. Um, I did it the right way because I had the right equipment and and just about enough knowledge to understand how to go about that process. And I think it's also a more organic record as far as uh, I wasn't really using too many like punch-ins and stuff like that. I was really like a lot of uh, the solos that I play there, they're just one take or they're like something from the demo that I just took and, uh, and put it on the record. Um, and um, this was, I, I'm really happy about the songwriting uh, specifically on this record. And I think the production came out really great. And Max Norman, I was fortunate enough to have him mixed uh, this record as well. Um, he mixed my he mixed my Live the Dream record, uh, my second album, and now we mix this one as well. Um, and it, it just I think that production wise, it really all came together. I think it sounds really good. Um, You're proud I've of it, had the pleasure of having Derek Riggs, the artist of Iron Maiden, uh, do the cover of this one again. It's he a did cool, my first cool concept cover. too. Yeah, and this was uh, actually a concept that um, initially was meant for Maiden for the Final Frontier record. Really? And for some reason, they went in a different direction. I don't know why. Yeah. And I told Derek, hey, why won't you do, it and do this for my record? And he did. You know. And, That's kind of um, cool. That's a nice tie-in between two bands. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, I, I love that. That's fantastic. Well, I encourage fans to check it out. All the links to all your properties are down below in our description, and Nocturnal has shared them in the uh, chat. And uh, what we'll do is, uh, as we wrap up here, just going to read two more comments here uh, from our own Nocturnal Butterfly. She says, thank you very much for your time, Ethan and Eric. I really enjoyed the stories and everyone in chat. And here's a cool thing. Happy Mother's Day to all the mamas. Treasure your mama if you got one. Uh, unfortunately, yes. we don't. We've lost both sets of our parents here, so we don't have a mom to celebrate with tomorrow. But she's a great mom. I'll be celebrating with her. And speaking of celebrating uh, with moms, uh, Guitar Hack here, as I mentioned at the start of the program, a good friend of mine here. Um, when, with his channel, he sells merchandise, and all the proceeds that he sells goes to cancer research. 
And yes. this is what he says. This is the best news I've heard in a long time. He says, spending time with mom tomorrow. I got her test results back. She's now cancer free. So that's nice to see, you know, these people out there that are raising money for, for cancer research like Guitar Hack. And um, and when you're getting the results back like that, I mean, that I can't think of a better gift for, for mom and for the family. So, yeah, enjoy your time with moms tomorrow. Make sure you spoil them. Uh, I'm going to make sure I do uh, my very, very best to spoil my better half here. And definitely the world's greatest mom. And, uh, you know, she she helps make this show what it is. I couldn't do it without her. So I, uh, I hope everyone has a great Mother's Day for sure. But we're going to wrap Absolutely. up. We're at 430 here Eastern Standard Time. I want to thank everyone for tuning in on this uh, new time slot. And I think we're going to keep things here on Saturdays. That allows people to tune in from other time zones that, you know, 9 o'clock at night, Eastern can be late for, you know, the you know, European uh, time zones and things like that. So I hope you had a good time. I had a wonderful time with you. Lots of questions I didn't get a chance to ask you. So maybe we'll invite you back towards the end of the year and we'll see what's that. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I'm good again. Yeah. And now i got to tell your sister, you got some big shoes to fill now. Your brother, man, we had a good 90 minutes. And, uh, I'm sure you... she'd love to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, cre- we'll create that sibling rivalry. Even if there isn't any, we'll create some now. Yes, awesome. that's what people like to do. That's Create right. The Stir the pot, right? Stir the pot. <laughs> Listen, don't yeah. go away. I'll say goodbye to you off the year. We'll say goodbye to everybody now. So we hope you all have a great weekend. And if anyone's tuning in tomorrow night, uh, if, if the moms let you watch Game of Thrones tomorrow night, second last episode, <laughs> are you are you a fan? I'm not. My uh, my brothers are, you know, and uh, it's uh, it's kind of strange to live in a world where you're not a fan of uh, Game of Thrones because hey, everybody else is. That That's uh, okay, though. I don't have I guess I just never watched it. So I've got friends that that don't even know what The Walking Dead is. So yeah, you don't have to be a fan of something just to be flavor of the week. I particularly yeah. like it, and um, it's going to be done. I, I live, I live under my rock. I still watch uh, old lynch mob videos on YouTube, and that's <laughs> kind of like my world. So. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's that's awesome. And sometimes, though, I mean, you know, I'm sure Eddie Van Halen didn't have much of a soul. We didn't have all the things we have today when, you know, back then. But, you know, didn't a lot of these great players didn't have much of a social life. It was focus, focus, focus on their craft. So, you know, yeah. there you go. Well, listen, well, thank you, Eric, and thank you for, uh, you know, supporting uh, keeps you keep supporting Van Halen and that whole rock and roll culture that you know, is getting lost. So thank you for, Oh, no problem. It's, it's fun. It, it's the ball rolling. It, it's, it's kind of my, uh, it's, it's one of these things where, you know, Eddie Van Halen doesn't owe us anything. Uh, you know, he's given, given us all so much, but I just feel in my heart, like he, he changed my life. He really did change my life. And all of us. I, I'm a one trick pony when it comes to guitar. I just, I just play Van Halen stuff. I really don't have my own sound even after, Oh, I kind of do, but not really. It kind of sounds schizophrenic, but it's all because of Eddie Van Halen. I just, from the day I heard, you know, uh, the, the, actually the very first song I heard was, uh, um, uh, the credible rock, which is not my favorite anymore, but it changed me. It just, the guitar changed me. And so uh, as, as long as we have YouTube and places to broadcast, I'll be giving my thanks back to Eddie Van Halen in some form or another. So it's awesome. But thank you. Thank you for the kind words. I appreciate that. And thanks to everyone who tuned in too. Yes. Thank you so very, very much. And uh, we'll say goodbye to you off the air. Everyone go have a fantastic weekend and take care of those moms tomorrow. Spoil them. And uh, we'll see you again here next time with nearly next week, 3 p.m. Eastern next Saturday. Until then. Cheers. Hey, you're still here? Eric Jr. here, reminding you to check out our full lineup of quality merch. Available right now in the Broadstash Boutique. Quality products and fast shipping. Visit Broadstash.com today. I am now on Patreon. If you enjoy my content and wish to support my channel and what I do, then please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash evhgeartv. Your support assures the continued growth of this channel and a fun community in which to share our love for Van Halen, music gear, and much more. My name is Eric Hansen, Wolfgang Guitar. Video production services provided by Design 39 Media. Visit design39media.com for all your website, photography, and video production needs. Microphones for EVH and Gear TV are provided by Rode Microphones. And official Van Halen merchandise is provided by VanHalenStore.com.